something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. Been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice for Vivian King. Tonight I have three guests in the studio who are my current, my reoccurring guests, but we're going to talk about current events tonight. There are a lot of current events that we want to vent about. Our friends, our colleagues, our associates, and the media is venting. And remember when we vent, we vent from an urban point of view. And everybody in urban America is not the same, so we do have different points of view. In the studio tonight, I have lawyer extraordinaire, Miss <laughs> Tina Watson, who practices primarily in Fort Bend County. I also have young attorney extraordinaire, Daryl Jordan, and uh, Jordan Daryl practices all over the state of Texas. And I also have Danny Sneed, Jr., the encourager from the Path to Freedom, who has been behind those bars, but will never go again. <laughs> and tonight, me, your host, Vivian King, we will discuss four topics tonight. We will discuss what's going on with the Sandra Bland case. We will also talk about Black Lives Ma Ma Matter and how we feel about our sheriff, Ron Hickman, rushing to judgment in a recent unfortunate and awful and terrible shooting of Deputy Goforth. We will also talk about the New York case of mistaken identity with James Blake. And lastly, we will talk about the recent event and set events and settlement in the Robbie Tolan case. So first of all, let's just get in with the Sandra Bland update. And I know, Tina, you've been vacationing for the last two weeks, <laughs> but if you have any items you want to vent or share about Sandra Bland, please do it. Well, I understand that the Attorney General is getting involved is the uh, last I heard in regards to the investigation. And I understand that there will probably be um, an arrest made soon, hopefully, um, in regards to the law enforcement's actions in her case. And um, Daryl, so I know that you were appointed as the head investigator for that case. So I am not going to ask you any uh, questions as it relates to your investigation, because I understand that's confidential. I'm talking to you as your former teacher, <laughs> law professor, uh, as a great student, as a lawyer, and as a man. So tell me just your emotional uh, reaction to the facts about Sandra Bland that have been publicly uh, reported in the news. Uh, I think it's just a, a real tragic situation. Um, because I think all would have viewed just from an objective uh, standpoint that it all could have been avoided. Um, the arrest um, and whatever took place in the jail, that all, all of those things, when you just sit back and look at it uh, with a calm, cool head, you can say, man, all of this could have been prevented in one way or another. And I don't care whose side you look at it from, you can say all of this could have been prevented. And so that's the really sad part, is that none of that had to happen. Yeah, and uh, before I get to Danny, one of my issues is, as I've said over and over, I smoked for 30 years and I was extremely neurotic. I still am, not extremely anymore, just neurotic. And um, when, when I saw the video, I saw something that most people didn't. From a smoker's standpoint, when the officer asked her to put her cigarette out, she, you, to me, when she said, no, I don't have to, that was a sign of her being neurotic. She was so nervous that she couldn't even make it through. Because people who are very emotional and maybe emotionally unbalanced smoke. 
And when they smoke, they're doing it as a calming uh, effect. And it's like a crutch you can't put down. And that's why so many nervous, neurotic type people, like if you're around me, you can tell I'm kind of neurotic. And when I used to smoke, they used to give me my time to kind of sit down. It would calm me down. And although it's not necessarily a downer, it's just the way it reacts to us. And that's why it's difficult. I've quit smoking, but I've had times when police or people, when things are out of control, your cigarette is your best friend. And that's why people can't quit. Like for me to quit after 30 years, I had to bury my best friend. I had to say like, since I buried my mother young, I've had a lot of important people die when I was young. You understand finality and it being over. And it really, because if my man was acting bad, my child, my friends were forsaking me, I had no friends in the world. I always had my cigarette. You could, that's why people can't leave it alone. That's why you'll see people on the street bums, bumming cigarettes because Nobody can stop you from doing it. And it's just like, it becomes your best friend. And it don't talk back to you. It loves you. It's kind of like people do with puppies or animals. You know, it's like your last and best friend. And that's why people are so, like a lot of people wonder why are people so, they like dogs more than they like people or other races of people. It's because that's their best friend. And, um, and that's not any, you know, it's not rational. She wasn't rational smoking, but he should have been trained to recognize the signs. And I, I believe that um, that was a real telltale sign of her neur neurosis. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she should have been mistreated like that. Uh, Danny brought to us that DPS code and creed is what, Danny? Um, to serve the public. Right. And, and they take pride in being an agency that's polite. Right. Talk about that, Danny. Um, first, I, I, I want to address the elephant in the room. And that's race and inequality in America. It's the most divisive conversation we have. And it's one that's, that everybody avoids. Uh, it, it just makes people uncomfortable, especially the, um, how do you describe them? Our Caucasian friends. Our Caucasian friends. And, um, but what's going on today is initially ruled a suicide. Bland death is not being handled just as it would be in a murder investigation. And this investigation is being led by the Texas Rangers with the supervision of the FBI. But what makes this problematic is you're using a local agency to investigate it. And this Asian Texas Rangers in particular doesn't have a history not protecting their own. Right. And uh, it also has a history of unfair rush to judgment uh, when it comes to black American and Mexican Americans. Uh, and I did a little research on the Texas Rangers. If you go to their web page, you would notice that they're highly linked to Confederacy. They use a lot of the symbol and the language. And um, they describe the, um, the, the darkest period of history to them was uh, um, I lost my thought. Okay. But here's the point. The Texas Rangers is not the right people to be investigating this. And DPS, as well as they have stayed out of the limelight, also has a, a, a storied history. Now, Sandra Bland family has filed a wrongful death suit, but the Department of Justice should conduct their own individual uh, investigation. Uh, about a month ago, I was in Washington, D.C., in front of the Justice uh, Department, and uh, a, a, a local grassroots organization had over 500,000 signatures uh, uh, that, that the media was there that they were asking the Department of Justice to investigate this case. So we'll just have to, it's like a wait and see type thing. Uh, this case is not going anywhere. Uh, we want to look at how that there's been a visual there. Recently they named a, sh a portion of the street that she was uh, arrested on. They named it after her in her honor. It was some pushback from that. But I believe they did the right thing by saying that what happened to her was wrong. And I digress with that. Yeah, my issue with her is just the mental health issue. I believe it was a suicide. Um, but I believe that, that the way she was handled, when you're depressed and sad and you're looking for hope and you're looking for a job, then you don't want to be mishandled by a person in authority. That can like knock you over the head. I remember being in law school 
broke down, depressed, and a cop was real, real mean to me. And I just broke down and cried. And I'm generally a strong person, a traffic ticket, whatever, but it was just, I couldn't take it anymore. It was just like, why are you being so mean? Why are you talking so ugly to me? It was just, and it was, I was parked somewhere. It was just about my inspection sticker being expired. And you know how you always hear that you have 10 days and it was within the 10 days. And I was like, man, why are you being so mean to me? I mean, I just wanted to just like, I just wanted to just go, you know, like piss pass out and just die. It's like, why? I mean, you know, I'm fighting against the odds. I don't have any encouragement for law school. I mean, you can just, I mean, a cop can make or break your experience, especially where your mind is at. Yeah. And so that's what's sad to me is I heard uh, Dan Patrick say that they looked at how he treated other black people. And like El Danny said, that's the elephant in the room. It's not how he treats other black people. It's how he treats pe females who are being belligerent, but look like they're upset. I bet if you could see her like one-on-one, -on -one, I know we saw a visual from a car, I bet she looked neurotic when he stopped her. You know, I bet she mm -hmm. looked, so, so, she looked out, out of sorts when he stopped her. Now he assumed, because she was black, that that was some like ready to fight thing, but he could have just given her a ticket and gone and say, ma'am, you look upset, is there anything okay? Are you okay? Yeah. And she might have bust out crying right then, because it seemed like he cared. You know what I'm just saying? You don't take force. No officer should be putting their hands on a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's period. That's what, that's what I'm upset about, putting your hands on her. I want to <coughs> know, I want to see how that same cop dealt with 10 belligerent white women that they stopped. Did they grab them and throw them out the car? That's my issue is I'm having problems with cops putting their hands on women. I'm still wanting to fight the cop in uh, uh, Dallas for putting his hands on that little girl because all I can see, my little girl has got the sassiest mouth in the United States of America and she's 20 years old. I want to beat her ass every time I talk to her and I'm spending 40000 a year to send her to law school, me and her daddy. And I want to fight her every day, but I would never put her hand in the dirt or the sand. And I want to fight the person who does it. You know, I don't want to talk to her. I want to tell her to get out of my house. I want to tell her to go to her daddy's house. But I would never let a man, her daddy, you, or anybody, put my baby's face in the, in the goddamn da dirt. I'm, ta I'm, ta I'm, I'm telling you. You're well, not doing it. I think what we know consistently with all the topics that you're going over tonight is that there's an overaggression that has taken place and it does take place consistently in the African American community. Yes, to an extent, the police may be over aggressive in some other times in some other communities, but not the extent that it takes place in the African American community and with we feel, African Americans. And we feel hopeless like it's okay. Half the people thought it was okay for that 250 pound man to sit on a 100 pound little girl that's naked. You know she ain't got no weapons. She's sitting down complying, but you think it's right to pull her up from a sitting position to lay her face in the ground and put your knee in her back? He could have broke that little girl like a pencil if he would have done the wrong amount of force. But we're all sitting here like that. We're okay with that. I know, uh, I knew because I was in a Dallas suburb, I go on the Tom John Cruise every year, and I know he's like me. He almost had a heart attack when he saw that. And I knew that cop was going to be fired if they had to personally fight, fire them themselves. We talked about that sure. on the phone that morning. Sure. I said, oh, that's not going to happen in Dallas. Yeah, yeah. They, well, they actually, they, they let him resign. And uh, when, the, when the girl is on the ground, her friends run up, and then the cop stands up and he punches one in the face and pushes him. And I represent those three. It's, oh, wow. it's two sisters and another friend, and we're suing. Uh, well, we're waiting on the Texas Rangers report to come back, whenever that's going to come back. And then from there, uh, hopefully they will find him to have done wrong, and then we'll be able to go forward with our lawsuit with, you know, with their report. But, you know, I, I think when we have this conversation, we also have to include the importance of voting because what they see is that we're a powerless people. And so they come in our neighborhoods and do things that they wouldn't do other places because they know that we're going to get up and go protest for a week or two and then disappear back into the shadows. And, and then when it's time to vote for the sheriff, that we're going to stay home. And, and, and so one of the things we have to do, though, as leaders, and what I say is that um, we, you, Daryl Jordan, mm -hmm. uh, Tina Watson, Vivian King, if we're going to call ourselves leaders, we need to put information on websites so people understand the process. I try to do it weekly, but and a lot of people have learned, but what I've l learned is that we are dying from lack of knowledge mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. Our community does not understand. To this day, all of the people we represent, I mean, not, I'm an exaggerator, so take that with a grain of salt, 90% of the people we represent to this day, and I've been representing families. When you've been doing this as long as sure. me and Tina, you re it's generational. 
they still think the judge makes the decision. Mm -hmm. When the DA is making the decision all day long, that's lack of knowledge. Right. And, and, and we need to put the information down. When I ran for judge, my website, you could click on all the judges. I even added a point like which judge was married to what judge and which mm -hmm. judge's husband was a DA. That's a little bit over the top, but we pay their salaries at public officials. Shouldn't we know the nepotism? Shouldn't mm -hmm. the people know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so I'm just telling. I've told the NAACP that's what you need. You need a website on how judges, uh, how every elected official affects the local government, how the local government runs. Not anything really hard, sure. but just a page. I talked to a new executive board member the other night, and I said. We should be able to go to the NAACP or the Urban League or somebody's website and say, why is it important to vote for mayor? Who does the mayor appoint? Why is it important when she appoints a police chief? What does it mean when the president is running? Who makes the laws? People think everybody in America, half the people, the same 80 percent that are mad at uh, the judges, don't know the judges don't make those, those decisions, are mad at Barack Obama like he writes the laws. Mm -hmm. I understand our people fail for lack of knowledge. We don't know who writes the laws. Congress writes the laws. Who's your congressman? They don't know. And the other big issue on that is it's not being taught in the schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. And at one point, it used to be taught. I, I, it was and, taught to me and, in San Antonio, and it was, and it was, in poor San Antonio Independent <laughs> School District. I, we know. My, the old people in my family still know politics because True. it was taught and the news, it's the news. That's why we have to have our own news. Because the news media is just going to talk about who got shot at the stop and rob this weekend. They're not going to talk about what's going on at City Hall. Sure, we have cable now and we have those stations, but it should be a news issue and news item of what's going on with City Hall. Can I, can I again address the elephant in the room? And, and, I, and, I, and I describe it as race and inequality. And let's look at a Dr. Ben Carson. And he, he looks like me, but his message doesn't represent uh, black America. But basically what he's saying is this. You don't bring up race and you don't bring up in inequality because it doesn't exist. And even when you're in a job and you're in an environment and you're a professional and you get a person or uh, start working for a Fortune 500 company, the quickest way to get ostracized and pushed out if you bring up the race word. If you ever come and approach your supervisor and saying, I believe this person is biased based on my color, that is a huge flag. And even my own people sometime in the conversation, I say, well, there are prejudice. We're teaching us, we're, it's taught to not to even approach uh, um, uh, in, in uh, America now race issues. It's like we're supposed to dismiss mm -hmm. our history and what we see with our own eyes and don't have the conversation about it. Yeah, and it's, 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 that's a very complicated subject for me because uh, Dr. Ben Carson probably does represent uh, some black people, just depending on who you are and what you're dealing with. Uh, I vote against my interests every election. I vote as a Democrat. And my wife is a doctor. Uh, I'm a lawyer. In the tax bracket that I am, I get hurt by the Democratic tax policies, but I, I, when I look at the Republican platform, I say that doesn't really fit me, and I understand I have family, cousins, brothers, everything else, and so I vote against my interests every election and vote for a Democrat to be in office. And so some people don't have that sense of compassion or sense of duty to other people uh, from their community and say, no, Dr. Ben Carson represents me and, you know, because he was in town the other day and, it, and on Facebook, a lot of people who just happened to be friends with me were talking about they win and they support him and they enjoy what he said. And so <laughs> different, just, it's, we don't live in the 50s, 60s or during slavery anymore. Now, being black, that just may be a skin color that we all share, but we may, none of us may have anything in common and don't face any of the same issues. That's just the nature of the beast. We don't have a common that, enemy. That's true. But let's, can we... let's talk about some more of our issues rather than that, because that's kind of, that's so esoteric mm -hmm. that it's not, it's, uh, I want to change that. So let's talk about the Black Lives Matter, Tina. Sure. Well, uh, I think that is the common theme when we talk about, again, the uh, over-aggression and the cases uh, that we are mentioning for tonight. Everything from Sandra Bland, uh, we will talk about James Blake, the tennis player who was taken down 
for uh, being an alleged credit card right. abuse. Right. Let's talk about suspect. the Black Lives Matter part. Um, and the fact that the movement was designed to bring attention to the fact that African Americans, specifically males, but all African Americans, lives are not being treated with the same respect that others are, especially in the criminal justice system. Um, we know that the matter, the uh, movement was attacked somewhat after Deputy Goforth's uh, horrendous murder and the fact that the movement was blamed as a motive, possibly, for that murder. And it turns out that, one, that particular suspect they have in custody suffers from severe mental illness. And not only that, uh, that particular suspect has not given anyone any indication of why he did what he did. They've gone through his Facebook, they've gone through the computer uh, software, they've gone through everything. It just appears this is a very disturbed man. But yet, the movement was attacked uh, during this period as a reason for his possible uh, motive. And I think that that is parallel to what happened during the Civil Rights Movement when um, Dr. Martin Luther King was attacked as well, saying that if it was not for what he was doing, the little girls in Birmingham would not have been uh, bombed and things would not have occurred. And so what we see is some history repeating in that when there are movements, um, people try to silence them. Yeah, it, it, it hurt Tina and I, I know, a lot when we heard that uh, Deputy Goforth was murdered, uh, you know, just inexcusably. But it hurt even more when our, uh, our appointed official that we pay the, the taxpayer dollars for assumes that it's Black Lives Matter because it's obviously something that is personally bothering him. It's like Danny said, it's the racist ele elephant in the room. So let me attack. I bet that sheriff is personally offended by the Black Lives Matter movement. So when he sees a crime, he goes for what he's offended by. But that's not what we pay police for. We pay police to investigate. So that was a personal opinion because it, and it's almost like if black lives matter, all lives matter. And, and, and Sheriff and, and, and our white brethren, this is what we want you to understand. White, black lives matter is the response from young Americans to white privilege. Because I had teenagers on a few weeks ago and they talked about, and these are 17 and 18 year olds, their white friends being stopped that they go to Pearland School with and for, with weed, drugs in their car, they were told them to go on. One of my Hispanic friends, who's 17, his daddy's a lawyer, he sponsors the show, uh, uh, Rudolfo Cantu is his daddy. Uh, the the uh, young man said he was, he was stopped just for a traffic ticket at 17. He had an Asian female in the passenger side. The officer went in her purse, which is in the back, found a doobie and charged him. But charged him, undercharged him, but wrongfully charged him. Obviously, Mauricio does not have a doobie. He does not have no drugs. He don't carry a purse, okay? It was in the purse. And he charged him with Class C paraphernalia, though, and undercharged. And, but they, all of their white friends are telling them they're not being charged at all. They're laughing, saying, oh, the cop's not going to charge me. And with the 60 plus year old sheriff of Harris County doesn't understand this is what the Black Lives Matter is about because the children and the young adults are responding to white privilege. They're letting you, 60 plus year old white person, know that our lives matter just like your children's lives matter. We don't want your children's lives to stop mattering. We don't want your children to not get the place that they think they should have. We just want to be treated equally. It's all about equality. We want you, if you're going to throw the little white 17-year-olds joint away and let them go, we want you to throw the little black child's uh, and the Hispanic child's doobie away or their joint away not to ruin their lives. Their friends are getting away with a privilege that your officers are letting them get away with. I had teenagers on here talking about that the other night. And that's the response to Black Lives Matter. We know your life matters. We know white lives matter, okay? We don't have no problem with that. Your life, white America matters to us. But what we want you to say is your black life matters too. 
and the kids are going to continue to say that, and, and the elders who are using that term wrong, it's because you don't understand why it's being used. So that's why I'm explaining it to you. That's why I had some 17 and 18 years on olds to explain how they feel. They're not a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. They talk to me about mm -hmm. how they feel on race, police officers stopping people, teen parenting, because one of the 19-year-olds had two kids, one when he was 14, one when he was 19. I learned a lot about that then. So they talked about issues, gay, being gay and 17 in school. They talked about the issues that are bothering them. So that's an explanation of what Black Lives Matter means. And I think one of the things that you and I were really outraged about was, you know, this was law enforcement jumping to a conclusion. Uh, basically rushing to judgment. And With lack of investigation, which is your job. And, and, and part of the problem is the due process and the investigation that is only fair when you're going to make a statement about a motive of an offense, you should have had some basis for it from the evidence that you collected, not just from some right supposition or raw emotion. You're law enforcement. We pay your taxes to investigate. And if you're going to conclude, I've always said and given my closing arguments, a conclusion is a point where you stop thinking. So if you've already made a conclusion, then you've already stopped thinking and you're not investigating. Yeah. And that's not fair. Yeah, uh, you know, and when he made that statement, he went on to be on, I think, every... Mm -hmm talk show there was nationwide, worldwide, CNN now, you can see it anywhere. And, and then uh, Devin Anderson followed them, you know, making her rounds. And so what they were doing was speaking to their constituents, right. speaking uh, to, what do they call them now, the silent majority. Is that what Devin, that's what Devin said, yeah, right? Yeah. The silent majority. Yeah, they need to stand up. Like this weekend, they still gathered a couple thousand people. And I don't have any problem with anybody gathering to represent a fallen service member, police right. officer, whatever it may be. But now they've awakened uh, that group to come out and they're gonna also come out to the polls. I remember when we ran for the election and you would look out at the uh, polls up at oh Kingwood God. or you know the people would be out there in, in huge numbers. Then when I would go look at the majority uh, black areas and nobody would come out and so the movement and I can't stress this enough it, we must take power and I see power one way is through voting. When you can kick people out when you can make the mayor accountable to you, then that makes the police chief accountable to you. When you make the sheriff accountable to you, then that makes the deputies accountable. And so until they start fearing their jobs, they're going to continue to come in our neighborhoods and kick people in the chest and then go out to River Oaks and then shake people's hand and say, hey, we hear there's a problem here. You know, so... It's all about the voting. We have to keep stressing that I have one vote just like Devin, just like the sheriff, uh, Ron Hickman, just like Trump. Everybody has one vote until some organizations. That means needs to be the 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 the, the effort and the reason for these uh, black organizations right now is to get people out to vote. If you're not doing that, then you shouldn't be doing anything. What we what what our community and what my culture need is a caveat. We need something that says, well, why should I vote? Besides, I should vote to part change. I mean, churches do it. Every organization that wants to get somebody involved. They put something out there free to entice them. Now, I know it's like you have, we need to be bribed. And I use me as an example, even though I will vote regardless. But it's like, why should I vote? Like, are you going, what do, do I get out of it? Do I get a keychain? Do I get like uh, $10 mm -hmm. off? And no. You get an opportunity for it, fairness. But that's not selling. Okay. So we need to do something But then different. don't call me for something free when you don't like how you're but, being treated in uh, county court number, blah, blah, blah. But or before we leave this earth, we want to do the much as we can to figure out what's the solution. And the thing we can do is have a conversation with the leaders, like at the church. The church can come out with a platform like, we need to raise more money to get a helicopter or get me a plane so I can fly around, uh, a la Clef Low Dollar. Now, if he can convince people to finance an uh, 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 airplane for him, what is he using? What caveat is he offering people that makes them say, I'll fund an airplane, but you can't use that same platform to get that many people to go out and vote? Mm -hmm. He had T.D. Jakes. I love Bishop Jakes. He has a huge platform. Joel Osteen, these people have people that'll, they, they say, go buy the sunny water, don't buy Zoka water. They'll do it. All right. So. The, the leaders can make a difference. Do they want to make a difference? 
Well, I think that you hit on some things. I think that we have a generation that does not understand the importance and the power in the vote, and they're used to getting things, getting something for something. Right. And um, I know I have um, young people, I have sons, and they will tell me that, that the reason their generation's numbers are so low in voting is because it has to be connected. They're selfish. Yeah. I, I'll be honest. Uh, my, my, my son Entitled. said, we're selfish. Entitled. Right. And, what, what am I going to get out of it personally? And, and, and what am I going to get out of it personally? And again, I think it's a combination of um, we did not educate properly in the schools. Um, and we have not done a good job of connecting it to everyday lives and empowerment. And that's what I want. That's why I think we need the websites. But we're at the halfway mark. So, uh, Mark, uh, Director Extraordinaire, can you play the James uh, Blake tape? YouTube. Can y'all see it? Thank you. It has no sound, so you can narrate. Oh, okay. All right. So let's play it. I don't. Okay. So let's just watch it. And the guy in the white. Okay, that's him. Yeah, they just take him down. You see, they just go and take him they down. Didn't He's ask just any standing there. Or anything. No, they don't say anything to him. Yeah. So Mr. Blake was waiting uh, to go to the U.S. Open, and he was sitting there texting. And he said he looked up and he saw somebody coming towards him. And he said he thought maybe it was a friend, a fan, or he didn't know what was going on. The guy never identified himself. He's in plain clothes. Plain clothes, no, no badge or anything, and said no words. And immediately uh, took him down to the ground. And as you can see, Mr. Blake is not fighting back He's at not all. moving. He's not doing anything. And, uh, wow. And, and, and notice... Start, let's start over, Mark. So, Mark, can you rerun it? Just out of curiosity, can you stop it and rerun it? I just think it's interesting to to rerun it just to show how he was just standing there. So look, that's Mr. Blake in the blue against the wall, just sitting there doing nothing. And let's look at how the man that walks in front of him, look, just see how it happens. And he's looking at him, come directly at him, because he said he thought yeah, he, he, just, he know just, him. No ID, no, no who nothing. are you? Nothing, just takes him down, just, I mean, and you just, I mean, he resists a little bit because he's like, you know, he doesn't know whether he should fight him or what to do. And, and look how the general public now, how we're so used to just seeing this. And Nobody walking. is stopping or just walking, carrying on their everyday life. Well, because it's a black man being arrested. It's a black man being arrested. We're used to that, and we think he's supposed to be arrested. And, we, and they already probably realized he that's an undercover it. cop because he got handcuffs on him. He and he deserves it. Whatever he did, he deserves it. And everybody's walking by saying, ooh, I wonder what he do. He got caught. That person right there in the red does kind of try to say something, but probably saying, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I found interesting. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I, I, I kind of used it to... Look at him. Look how he's doing it. Look how he's doing it. Got him sitting now. Spread. And where are the other officers? Uh, apparently, like, five more officers come get him again. So. Look at him. He's handcuffed. He's taken down. And what's so awful about that is... Now, this is, goes back to our generational discussion, you know, Daryl. Mm -hmm. uh, you might think it's okay. But in our generation, if there was a warrant for somebody, first of all, you tried to go to their house. If you didn't know where they lived, you wouldn't just think a suspect off the street just happened. Mm -hmm. You look at a picture, that's him. You Officers have police po procedures. You're supposed to go up to a man without a weapon and say, you know, sir, I'm a police officer. Uh, do you have any identification on you? You look like a suspect that we're looking for. Let the person know what you're doing. If he's going to run, he's going to run. You got... That cop is not by himself. That's a takedown unit there. So he's unarmed. Have a conversation with him if you really want to be that bold to arrest a stranger in a public place. Because uh, you could be completely wrong. And that man, the Constitution, that's why it's so important that we fight for it. The Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment was written for police mistakes. It wasn't written so, oh, oh, I'm sorry I broke your neck. Oh, I'm sorry I made you miss the U.S. Open. That man missed the U.S. Open, and he's, and he's played in the U.S. Sure. Open. Sure. But he missed it because an officer didn't ask him for his ID, because that ID would not have been who he was looking for, and that picture probably would have matched the face that the man had, okay? So he would have realized that's the wrong person. He didn't even try that first. He went into sure. over-aggression. And officers have manuals, and I bet that's not the way he's supposed yeah, to handle them. It's really sad that just the generational gap in what you grew up with and what I grew up with Because people weren't handled like yeah, that. You can, when yeah. I grew up, people were not handled yeah. like that. People talked to people first. They tried first. They might have had a whole surveillance team. They might have had them swat. But they tried to discuss 
and negotiate and sure. properly investigate first. Yeah. They did not overly be overly aggressive to where you, as a lawyer and a young man, think it's okay. But like I said, you have small children. Mm -hmm. Let one of them be uh, mistreated, then you'll understand how we feel. You won't. You'll also you'll be holding on tight to the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment of the Constitution when you're ready to go in their ass. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I recognize that it's wrong, but just as a criminal attorney and getting these calls and hearing my clients getting beaten, how they get treated, and I just see it. That's and you've never read cops, the operations yeah, manual. See, you don't even act. realize yeah. they, there's a manual to tell them how to behave. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and it's unfortunate that senior lawyers like us, when I have a case like this, and Tina knows it, I will subpoena the operations manual. Mm -hmm. sure. But that's a lot of work. But, you, but that's you what you need to do. You can do it through because, Freedom of Information freedom, Yeah, you yeah, can yeah, find you can out what they're tour. supposed to do. There's a right way sure. to tow policy, all of the policies, and we have to hold our law enforcement officials accountable. Let's take a phone call. Caller, turn your volume down, off, and state your state your comment, please. Uh, yes, I was just listening to um, your true de uh, justice about and watching how this gentleman was taken down without, you know, any asking of his ID or knowing who he actually was. And um, this seems to be a common occurrence. Um, I've been living in Germany for like the last 18 years and just moved uh, back to Houston in January. And I've traveled pretty much all over the world, and it just it it seems to happen all the time, and it it happens a lot to, you know, people of color. And I'm just dumbfounded that coming back to the states after all this time, this is still going on. Well, Thank you for calling, and you understand our frustration. It sounds. Are you a a, a, a Caucasian person? No, actually, <laughs> I'm African American. Okay. Well, I was just gonna say if if, 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 if well then. It, it, it's insulting, and if you were white, I was going to say you can just see it's not, it's not like we want white people to be mistreated. We just want to be treated fairly. That's all I keep wanting to stress is that, and that's where white Americans get it wrong with the Black Lives Matter. It's a response to white privilege. It's not your life doesn't matter. We're saying there is white privilege. We understand it. We recognize it. We ain't even mad at you for it because we understand the elephant is in the room because when you talk about race, people don't want to give up the power that they have because race, racism is also power. So who's going to ever give up the power? You got to take power mm -hmm. and you got to take equality. Ma'am, you have another comment? Uh, yes. I also wanted to say while I was visiting Chicago, probably back in, I think it was like 2012, and I was at a, a hotel, a very nice one, sort of just like this gentleman too, and I was walking out and I saw two black teenagers being pulled over by a police officer. So I started filming the, you know, because they, they, they were scared. They're definitely scared. And I went up to the car just a ways, and I said, um, you know, do you need any help? Are you okay? I said, what happened? And she's like, well, he pulled us over because our music was too loud. I said, was your music too loud? She goes, no, because we had our windows down. And uh, all of a sudden I was told, oh, move back, move back, move back, which I did. Um, but I kept on filming. So after let the teenagers go, uh, all of a sudden they came and jumped me, just like they did this man here. And I was, I was like, did they you know, take they your? Did, they, they, did they, they take they your my, video? Did they take? Yes, your... they took my telephone. Yeah. They sure did. That's what they do. Yeah, when the officers jump you, they take your phone. They either destroy it or they arrest it. I mean, or they say you're interfering with the duties of a police officer. But our United States Supreme Court came down with a case over the last few years to say that you have an absolute right to record. So uh, if that happens, you know, you are supposed to try to remember the, the shop number and file a complaint on those officers, because they work for you. Yeah, thank, thank you for your you. call. We're going to continue uh, our discussion. And thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. You know, one of the things I've noticed that in the conversation, everybody in America, white and black, is not saying there's not a problem with race. But here's the issue, is when we see what we see in our eyes, is there's no accountability. Sure, they'll bring them in, like this offer in Cena, he's already Department of Public Safety. He's been put on administrative leave. They did uh, uh, immediately admit that he didn't follow policies. But here's the thing, he's not gonna lose his job. They're not gonna fire him. You mean the one with Sandra Bland? Right. What they're going to do is... I thought is, the news media said that there could be an indictment. Well, that's... The AG's off. It hadn't happened yet. Okay. It wasn't immediate like the, the other guy. They got immediately fired. But what it is is we see these things happening, but these officers are not losing their jobs. And if they do lose their jobs, 
like you stated earlier, if I'm allowed to resign, that means I can go work somewhere else. Sure. Well, that happens, and unfortunately, that's part of the culture, so to speak. Tina, can you hold that thought? We have one more call. Sure. Uh, caller, you're on. Please oh, state. Okay. Tina, please state your call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they can resign and they can go work somewhere else, and that's part of what they understand they can do, and it's almost acceptable. And it's, it's also done. a part of white privilege. They become that's uncomfortable. What, and that's what people believe. People believe that's it privilege, is. It is. and that's what hurts the black li that's why the Black Lives Matter is a bold response by young people in their 20s, and I appreciate it because, like Tina said, people in their early 20s are selfish and it doesn't affect me. This is something that's pulling young people together to say, this could affect me, so let's move together. Let's band together. Sure. Let's see where it goes. And, sure. and, I, and I hope those that results in voting, but if you think back to Mayor, uh, mayor de Blasio up in New York, and he's uh, in an interracial marriage, black son, black daughter, when he came out and he spoke about uh, he feared that something may happen to his son and he's had that conversation, that, that's simply all he said. The police turned their back on him because they said that he wasn't being supportive of police. And so when these elected officials, again, control who is the next police chief and, what, and who's the next sheriff, then nobody's going to run for office on, I want to make sure everybody gets justice. Like, when I ran for judge, and same with Vivian, uh, we want to make sure justice looks the same for everyone. Sure. But the mayor's not going to run on that. No, which mayor has addressed these issues? None. Because it's right. the elephant. You know, you know, Nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room. They want to appease the well, people. Well, it's not the elephant to vote. them. Yeah. It's, it's an elephant sure. to us. It's sure. not an elephant to them. Sure. It's the privilege sure. to them. Sure. Yeah. So, so it, no one's going to talk about their privilege and give up their power. That's the issue. And so, if you have the privilege and the power, do you give that up? No. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what Tina's children and, and our children have to understand: you got to take the power, mm -hmm. and you take that in the vote, in the conversation, in not just the vote, but the vote and the demand. I mean, we need people your age running, Daryl. Keep running, keep running. You got to run for something. I don't care if it's if it is city council. I don't care if it is the mayor. It might not be judge, but we have to keep running. I'm ready for the people in their 30s to just take over mm -hmm. the Texas House and make marijuana legal. It's time to get rid of these old people. Y'all have enough people to vote. They just don't vote. Right. If you right. can make them vote, y'all can get an issue, make a weed issue. So you're gonna let casino gambling be right. uh, the law if you're in Austin. Get it done. I, it's time for y'all to take over. Get these old ha old hags out. They already have. Uh, uh, probably got, um, what do you call it, retirement already. They've sure. done enough Eight terms years, for that. Yeah. yeah, they've done enough terms. So, uh, I, I hate to be so radical, but I'm saying it radically to kind of make you laugh a little, but to also make you think. Because you got to take over. Y'all can take over. And it's time. Well, let me say this on a James Blake video as well. It made me think about Trayvon Martin. Because James Blake is older. I'm not sure what his age is. And he has enjoyed a middle-class lifestyle, a successful lifestyle. And so his reaction was that of a person that's mature and that did not feel threatened. Now, you take a young man, 17 years old, who was coming from a store in the dark of night by himself, and somebody came at him the way that Zimmerman did. And he's on the phone, minding his own business. You're going to have a young man that will act defensively and that's going to fight back. <laughs> and that was one of the problems I had in the Trayvon Martin case, and that is that Zimmerman was able to use the self-defense when actually... Trayvon he, Martin was the one defending himself. Trayvon Martin was the victim that was defending himself from a guy in plain clothes who was not even a police officer. Who was stalking him. Who, who was, was bigger, stalking older. Him and, and taking him down. So, my point is this. You saw in James Blake, and that was good. I'm glad he was subdued and, and so on. But you have to put age with that. You have to put lifestyle, uh, middle class, education, it all those daytime, things. It was daytime. It was open daylight. They're not going to beat him up too in bad. In a hotel. Right. In a hotel lobby and so on. So those are some of the parallels that I saw and I compared, and I just it made me think about that poor child in that situation and how different in the dark it was. on the phone chilling with his girlfriend, ain't thinking about that he got to fight himself from a grown man who's decided that he's a criminal. Me, I mean, he, his mind is just not there. Let me give you two ideas that could get young people to vote. One, 
Let's take someone with a huge platform like a Jay-Z or a Beyonce. They're the only ones going to be able to do it, the rappers. Say if, if Beyonce, mm -hmm. say I'm going to do a concert at the Toyota Center, but every person that's between the age of 18 and 25 that registered a vote, you will come to get to see this concert for $5. five dollars. I'm going to come to Houston, give a benefit back to boat concert, and then I'm going to get Michael Jordan to, for everybody that does that, I'm going to let you get my tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put out a special edition tennis shoes just to get people to vote in the next election, and you can get them for only for $100. Mm -hmm. See, these people have huge platforms, and these people will almost like lay down like, man, I'm going to see Beyonce, but you got to go register to vote. Mm -hmm. Start setting up them voting booths in, in Third Ward and all those places and say, if you register to vote, Everybody going to the Beyonce concert. How, what do you think the turnout would be? I can even I, I even think this. I think it'd be great. But I can even think this. If Beyonce did like Oprah and just came and talked, right. I think they would go just to hear her talk. I don't think I don't I don't even think she'd have to put on her True. five million dollar production for, right. to make somebody come out. I think if she just said I'm coming out to talk and they paid five dollars and had to vo register to vote to go to the Toyota Center just, just to hear, hear her, her talk. just to hear her talk about her life and why it's important. I'm just saying but that has to happen and I, I think Jay-Z and, and Beyonce we do wear out our leaders they did a lot in getting Barack Obama elected. They didn't okay. do it in Texas because they uh, Barack Obama blew off Texas, but they did it in Florida, and they did it in some of those uh, eastern seaboard states where they were giving concerts. Right. I heard they were going door to door. I heard they were doing everything. They spent millions. That's why okay. she was singing at those inaugural. So they, right. they did do their part, but we got to do our part local, and we got local rap stars. We got right. local rappers. I mean, we got that can still command a crowd here. Because, I mean, because basically when the Democrats or people lose in the... Um, gubernatorial races, it's only by 50,000, 100,000 votes. You got 500,000 uh, young adults that's not voting, that you can get out there to vote. It's not that many, it's just to get the platform to get them out there. During the during the uh, presidential races, people are only losing by five and 10 and 15,000 votes. So that's just, I mean, I have enough sorority sisters that could have hit me over the edge, but I couldn't because we're stuck in some other era. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to even get into that. So, uh, shade. Tina. That's some shade. You just threw some shade. I've learned that term. I threw some shade. I'm, I'm hurt. <laughs> I'm hurt because, you know, we have organizations that we've given money to and time and respect for 30 yeah. and 40 years that, that, have, that, that when somebody on a national level, like uh, uh, Loretta Lynch gets there, everybody's supporting them. But locally, we probably got 100,000 Deltas here that could have pushed both Tina and I sure. over the over the edge. That's that's hurt. And if whether it's shade or not, it's just the truth. Okay. Yeah, and pe people have to see that value uh, in the voting. And I, I really think it just need to help people understand. When I worked as a staffer, people would call me and tell me their house was in foreclosure. And I was like, why would you call your state representative and say your house is in foreclosure? I was like, I'll call them, but I don't know what it's going to... Oh, you're from who? Okay, yeah, we'll stop it. Tell them we'll accept this payment. You know, they, they wouldn't even accept this money anymore. I called them, they told the guy, come on in. And so that was my first awakening into the power of elected officials when they're calling uh, banks or state agencies or whoever it is because elected officials have the power to change any industry in the world, with you a know, swipe of a pen. Hold that thought, um, caller. That's please good. turn. Uh, please turn your volume down and uh, state your comment. Thank you. Okay, it's down. How you doing, Miss King? Hey, how are you? No, oh, you looking good tonight. <laughs> As usual, every, I watch here with tonight. Thank you, and, Tracy. Uh, okay, how you doing, Danny? And uh, how you doing, Tracy? Tina? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, 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 Tina. Yes. Tina? Hello. And and, and, there, and there, see, I'm, I'm trying to watch y'all online. It keeps loading up and buffering out, but I'm, I'm listening to I'm watching. Anyway, uh, I wanted to comment on something uh, I heard Danny said minutes ago. He, he wants to know why uh, the leaders ain't stepping up. I can tell you why they ain't stepping up. Because they might be afraid to. Sometimes history has a way of repeating itself. And you think, you know, some some things that happen uh, when people try to speak up in the past, what happened to them. And, you know, have you seen the uh, Rosewood and uh, what happened down there in uh, Oklahoma? Right. You know, so I, I'm just saying something. I, I think uh, maybe they may be afraid to speak up. You know. You know that that might be true, but that's sad because that is what they're elected for. Uh, unfortunately, if you have a minority district you're supporting, you can't just 
go along to get along. You you got to continue to fight. Yeah, and that's what's more... okay. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Derek. Go ahead, no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Tracy. Okay. Uh, well, I want to say he might not be talking as deep as uh, the state representative. He might be talking like, what about some of your pastors? He preaches in the church, collecting all your tithes every, every uh, week. Why, why come we can't uh, take some of that money? Look, look how much money we collect every every Sunday in these black churches. Why they can't put that money to do with, you know do something you know to improve the situation that we're going through? Be we careful, care about, Tracy. Be careful. I don't care. I don't care. I'm, 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 willing, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to go there. <laughs> so go YouTube with the, you know, the court, uh, but up your saying, man, I'm, 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 I'm going to go down, you know, like that. There. I agree. I agree. The church is, I mean, but for the church, we wouldn't have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean, but for I mean, all of the civil rights leaders who weren't afraid to speak up were churches. But, you know, President Bush was smart. He got rid of all that by mixing uh, church and state and letting these churches all become 5013C. So their business is not in that church, Tracy. Yeah. Yeah. They businesses. I, I, I and so, uh, I, you know, once they, we mix uh, church and state and they start getting big grants and government grants, the churches, to uh, build communities and houses right and, and uh, right here in Houston, and they stop speaking up because, oh, we can't mix policy. You know, we'll they, lose our money. Yeah, they start. No, 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 and no, they no, never would lose their money if they talked about a member of their church. But I'm just saying that was a... That was not what the tax code says. That's what not what the IRS 5013C tax code says. But Tina and I looked that up when we ran sure. for judge. I yeah. said, Tina, I'm an accountant. That's not what it says. It's just being misinterpreted so that the churches can not bite the hand that's now feeding them because they're all businesses instead of churches. So, you know, some smart Republicans took care of that. And our churches ran, our churches decided, a lot of them decided not to be churches anymore because, you know, you when black people had a problem, that's where we went to the church. But if you have racial problems, it's not far you can go these days so yeah there's you, you, you know you know you know just start telling you be careful of my what you see be careful of my what you say you know they, they start saying it's it time to start saying i'm like michael it's time to stop <laughs> it's time to stop saying it so it's when i hear you baby thank you for calling tracy all right, all right. good night y'all have a good night you, you too, too. You say daryl you know it's it, it's sad i used to wonder why quanell x had so much power but now that i've been here since 1999 i realize there's nowhere else to go. There, none of these. He's big, not scared. He's the only yeah, one that's not scared. None of these big time elected officials. And I saying. And I, I know because I take your words because they are old and they off doing their world. They handling their own business. Personal. They don't have time to be worried about what's and going on care. with the people. No, they have time because yeah, they retired. You know. Their kids are grown. So yeah. those old people do have time. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, that a lot of people have the titles for the title's sake. And as Tina and I learned, I told Tina when she was frustrated like you, mm -hmm. running for judge, I was so proud of her. I said, Tina, black people don't listen unless you have a title. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, they're not listening to us because we don't have a title yet. We're just lawyers. Right. I said, we, our community only comes out when someone has a title. And most of the people who have the title because we've been, they're mostly Democrats, they don't really have any power where they go to, to work every day, but they have power in our community because mm -hmm. our community is so snobbish. We only care if you have a title. You don't care if you're down for the mission. It's the title. Yeah, that, and that's that's sad. And we've sad. been kicked off the ship on many a day for someone who had a title and we didn't have one. That's right. Is that, that right, Tina? That is. That's absolutely right. It is true. Well, we also have to see that churches were a vehicle of change. It was where you went for refuge historically. And um, we don't have that right now in, in our communities. Um, our communities are segregated in the sense that they're not cohesive. The pastors don't live in the community in which they are the shepherd. <coughs> uh, some live in Kingwood and other places. And the woodlands. And they are not really into the fabric of what's going on in that area. Just like the police officers, and, isn't that interesting? And, 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 as, and yes, and as a result, they're not as vested as they probably would be if they had a home and their kids were in the schools and they were actually in the community. And so that vehicle change that historically African Americans enjoyed in the church, uh, we really don't have like we used to. And that's something that we need to address, talk about, and we need to fill that gap because it is a gap. It's definitely a vacuum and a gap. Yeah, but I, I think more so today when people go to church, they go to be entertained and the preacher goes to get paid. And so... And then he goes to Sugar Land or Kingwood <laughs> or the Woodlands, but that's not where his church is. Mm -hmm. His church is still in, you know, Sunnyside, down near town, Fourth Ward, Fifth Ward, 
Uh, what are some of these other, you know, there are more and more minority churches like in sure. Missouri City, I think in Pearland, because it's so, it's, they've become so, such mm -hmm. a minority mm -hmm. uh, driven uh, communities. But I'm, I agree with Tina, so many, I'm, I was surprised, because you know, in my day in San Antonio, even when I first moved here, the preachers lived in the parsonage that was owned by the church. I was United Methodist, so that's right next door in the across the street from the school, across the street from everyone. Just like Tina said, they were vested in the community. But when you're when you live in the woodlands and your church is in Windsor Village, or you, or your church is in you know Fifth Ward or Acres Home, but you you live in the woodlands, you you got to spend time in the woodlands to be vested in that community. Mm -hmm. So you're not vested enough. I agree. Yeah. Well, well I, I hope somebody wakes up, and I hope that our voices are causing somebody to think and say, what can I do to help bring about change? Because in, until, you know, that's my only issue with the Black Lives Matter movement. The name itself alienates others. And until we all come together and recognize this is an all of us problem. When I used to work for the senator and people would call in, white people, because uh, he was on the criminal justice committee and want to tell their stories about how their kids were mistreated. And I wanted to say, wait a minute, this your first time hearing about this? You didn't know this happens every single day? And so when we exclude people or people feel excluded, they don't join in the cause. But I mean, we are Houstonians, we are Texans, we are Americans. And when one American is mistreated, we should all unite around the Constitution and demand that people be treated right. And people should be able to run, to run on office, run to office and say, I'm running and I want everybody to be treated right. But nobody will run and say something like that, not if they're not from our and, and And unfortunately, the um, a lot of the establishment, that silent majority, wouldn't vote for you because right. what, you, what you're missing, Daryl, is the elephant in the room, the white privilege wants to stay that way. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what you're, that's what a lot of younger people don't realize, and that's why everybody's ignoring it. And that's why, to me, it's important that you have Black Lives Matter, because that means you're facing it head on. And, the, and they have white people in that movement. I've talked in some of those speeches, sure. so, so they understand. We have one minute, believe it or not. So if you want to say something, stop going through those papers. <laughs> uh, you no, say I'm something. Just from your heart. say something about Robbie Tolan? Uh, um, in one minute? Uh, not, we may not get to him tonight. No, probably not. Yeah, we probably won't get to him. We got one minute. So. I just want to thank you for having this platform, so we can have to continue to have this conversation, so we can talk about the elephant in the room and bring him on out, get on top of him, ride him, feed him, give him some peanuts. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've met his mom on a several occasions, so mm -hmm. I would like to have the conversation actually with her here. Sure, of and course. And so I'm going to see if I can get her back. And if you want to make that four-hour trek to come back, I'd love ah, for you to come anytime I you know. want to, anytime ah. you can, and anybody else. I think because she has a lot of history, she's the one that told me about the. United States Supreme of Court case, yeah. how she felt, and I want to try to get her to come. And it was just another example of overaggression. Um, again, that whole incident that what happened to that young man, uh, the cops rushed to judgment and immediately uh, took excessive force, shot him, hurt him, and ended his potential baseball career. Another example, all of these cases are <coughs> examples of overaggression on African Americans in an African American community. I agree. And so we're saying to wrap it up. So um, I want to thank my guest, Tina Watson, uh, from driving all the way in from Sugar Land. It's a long <laughs> drive on 59 South, the Beast. And uh, Daryl, doing the same. I know you live way out 59 North. And so uh, um, I'm going to tell you where you live so they can come get you. <laughs> and uh, then Danny, thank you for coming in from wherever you live. <laughs> <laughs> Far away. Uh, for uh, you know, expressing ourselves because we have to have different points of view. And I hope my friends and colleagues respect and understand our points of view that we have to discuss these things and all we want is equality. That's all we want. We just want to be treated the same. We understand police officers are afraid of criminals or violent people. I am, we all are, but we have to figure out a way that if you have policies and procedures, follow them. If it's an, a, a, a scary situation, have a whole bunch of police officers there. Do what you're trained to do, uh, but don't over attack us. Give us a right to be free. We thank you for calling. We thank you for watching. And um, please tune in next Wednesday when we have another interesting topic where you can express your views on truth and justice with Vivian King. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For tuning in again tonight, tonight we have something tonight. really good. A hot topic in the news this but week. He's been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories.